Hello, everybody. It's my great honor to be here, and especially among all these amazing speakers. I really appreciate all of your work in fighting against this anti-China propaganda. My name is Li Jingjing. I've been working as a journalist for over eight years now. And today I'd like to address three main aspects. Western media's bias, how positive voices about China are being oppressed, and the reality in Xinjiang. I was born and raised in China. You see, as a Chinese, sometimes if you say you actually like the government, simply because your life has gotten better and better, I'm proud of my root and my culture, and some, people in, some people in the West will immediately call us being brainwashed to like China. The poor Chinese that has never seen the free world. On Twitter, they call those Chinese bots, Wu Mouse, or in my case, because I travel around reporting the interesting stories of people in different parts of China, they call me the mouthpiece, the CCP shill, like we all aren't able to have our own opinions. So I noticed there's a strange phenomenon. Some people from Western countries, on one hand, they claim they love China, they love Chinese people. We stand with the Chinese people and we want to liberate you. Yet on the other hand, giving insulting stories like Wuhan virus, blaming Chinese people's eating habits or culture for the pandemic, blaming Chinese stealing their technology, their jobs. It's like they're saying, we stand with you, we fight for your rights, but your culture is disgusting, you poor brainwashed oppressed Chinese. We want you to have a better life, but it better not better than ours. So how hypocritical that sympathy for Chinese is. It's a really strange and funny phenomenon. And China has changed greatly over the past 100 years from a war-torn country. People didn't even know where their next meal would be to a country that lifted 800 million people out of poverty, a country that has one of the world's best infrastructure, a cutting edge technology. Those are the things that we couldn't even dream of having decades ago. And those made Chinese, our life dramatically better than before. So many things changed Yet what didn't change is the depiction of China in many major media outlets in the West. And they played a major role in creating this negative image of China around the world. I studied journalism both in China and the UK. So I do have a certain amount of knowledge about Western journalism, Chinese journalism. And I do read news, domestic news and international news and make, make comparisons. So don't get me wrong, I do understand fair and balanced criticism news is important for improving. But honestly, most of the reports about China on some Western media outlets is not in any intention to genuinely help China, but rather feeding off their government's foreign policy to paint a negative image of China. For example, in CNN's recent um, exclusive investigation of Xinjiang, in order to further push their narrative that Xinjiang is a surveillance state, they keep showing the close-ups of loads of traffic monitoring cameras, which exist in every city in China, and I'm sure in other countries as well. Those cameras are there to catch cars that violate traffic rules, not just to monitor people all the time. And in order to portray Xinjiang as a police state and prisons and camps everywhere, they drove a car quickly driving past the gate of local high school so people won't be able to read the name that says it's a high school. And their cameras focuses on the security guy in front of the gate. So people would thought that's probably a prison or a camp. But in reality, it's just a high school with the guards protecting the kids. And they always choose the strangest angle to shoot, like they are hiding from, they're shooting while hiding from a corner. You know, from that angle, even kids playing happily in the playground looks like oppressed scene. And they love to barge into places without permission or advance notice. So security guards would inevitably stop them from entering. People don't want to be interviewed with avoiding them. And that would be their biggest story. They could say, they could use the headline, China stop us from exposing its deep secrets. So tell me what would happen to you if you do the same thing in US, in UK, or any other country. People will stop you. Some, in some places, please shoot people while driving a car. So I don't know why they're doing this. 
So, and especially if Xinjiang is really prison, really like a prison, like what you said, why do you have to use such dirty tricks to create a negative image of China? So all of those are the dark art of journalism. Throwing a bunch of footage of traffic surveillance cameras, security guards, made the color of the footage dark, add some filters, and all of this footage will give a psychological hint to the viewers that this is a horribly oppressed place. And although self-acclaimed witness they interviewed, they just blindly believe whatever ridiculous claims they are saying. Even some of their stories are full of loopholes. Some of the witnesses um, change their stories again and again whenever they do an interview with a different media. But they still broadcast it. In the recent CNN's report, they even said CNN cannot independently confirm whether it's true. So if you cannot confirm it, why are you broadcasting it? You don't have a story, but they still go for it as long as it's saying China bad. And all of this is the result. Um, we do see the result of this media feeding off Western government's foreign policy. Pew Research shows two years in a row that since 2020 that Americans have historical high negative views towards China. And China is being regarded as the bully, even though it didn't wage any war for decades. But American and many Western governments participated in hundreds of wars. Quite, quite strong propaganda skill, I have to say. And the uh, second is the allegedly free speech that many people in the West bragged about is so hypocritical, I have to say, especially on stories about China, which means you are free to criticize China, slander China, but you cannot say anything good about China or communism. I know a lot of people get attacked get cyberbullied simply for telling what they saw and experienced in China. And their stories happen to be contradict to what several Western, Western media governments anti-China propaganda. I, as a Chinese, Chinese woman, get a racist and misogynist attacks online all the time. And I know several expat YouTubers based in China who are sharing their observations, their life in China, and they disagree with the Western mainstream media and they got caught CCP shields. They are being accused of taking money from Chinese government to speak positive things about China. And I know these, I know some people, their personal information were leaked and they got serious threats, death threats, just because they said China was doing something good. Some of them have to close their accounts and stop being in public expressing their views anymore because it really put their life and career in danger. So what kind of freedom of speech is that? And when the media is all about Xinjiang and lots of people who just learned the word Uyghur yesterday and suddenly saying how concerned they are about the situation in Xinjiang, you would think they'd love to hear voices from Uyghurs, learn, about, learn more about Uyghurs. But you know what? Uyghurs accounts would be attacked and closed if you're not saying you are, you are oppressed and live a horrible life. I know these two Uyghur influencers, two young Uyghur girls who share their daily life, cultures of Uyghurs, lifestyles, traditions, and food and sceneries in Xinjiang. Um, their account's name is Stories of Xinjiang by Guli. They are big influencers in China. That They have 2 million fo followers on China's TikTok for quite a long time. They are being featured by the fashion magazine Cosmopolitan in China last month. And when they decided to expand their market to overseas a few months ago, their Twitter and YouTube accounts got targeted by a group of anti-China people, calling them fake Uyghurs, calling them China propaganda tool, and their Twitter account was closed by Twitter. So all this care about Uyghurs from some people in the West are so hypocritical. What they really mean is, I care about you only when you meet my stereotype that you are oppressed, poor race, live a, living a horrible life, don't have basic human rights, and are waiting for us to save. If you say you're actually live quite comfortably, nah, you're fake. How can you not need us as white saviors? And the last I want to say, uh, I want to talk about uh, the reality in Xinjiang. Many people and the media outlets in the West who are keen on reporting on Xinjiang, I think they're neglecting how extremism, separatism, terrorism were damaging Xinjiang. A group of jihadists conducted thousands of terrorist attacks across Xinjiang, across China, and also in several other countries. So it had serious impact 
of people's lives, not just Han people, Uyghurs as well, and people of all ethnic groups. A Uyghur musician friend of mine, he has a rock band with four Uyghur members. They are trying to combine um, Uyghur music with rock music, trying to modernize Uyghur music. He's very passionate about music. And it's very easy to find talented musicians and dancers among Uyghurs because music plays a big part in Uyghur culture. And actually, if you go to Xinjiang, you probably will run into some crowds of people dancing from time to time because it's not stage, it's just part of their life. Um, this uh, uh, rock band singer, Uyghur friend of mine told me when the extremism was ravaging Xinjiang, suddenly, they were not allotted to play or listen to music anymore. They cannot sing and dance during weddings. They cannot cry at funerals. They were asked to not wear their traditional colorful Uyghur clothes anymore. Uh, you probably have seen some images, traditional Uyghur clothes are very, uh, it's a combination of bright colors, very colorful, but they are, re they are requested to not wear that any by, by those extremists. So, and you know, in, in Rumqing City Center, this is the main road between the famous Grand Bazaar and the Night Food Market. Several years ago, when the uh, terrorism was still ravaging, people were afraid, were afraid to walk on that road because from time to time, there were attacks. Uh, once a min minority girl got her hair pulled, legs whipped by random guys on the streets because the guys just told them, minority girls should just cover yourself up. I'm not saying women shouldn't cover themselves. Some women choose to wear certain clothes, cover themselves, either because of what they believe, be their, their religion. As long as they truly believe that that's what they choose to do, it's fine. But uh, what I just mentioned is those uh, people are asking Uyghurs to do something they are, it's against their culture, abandon their music, abandon their culture. You know, a lot of Uyghurs are not even Muslims but there are a request to follow these extreme rules. So that's a real cultural genocide. So I think the cultural genocide were not forced by Chinese government, by the, the group of jihadists. So I think people should be very careful. This group of people, they are the ones that are conducting not just cultural genocide, but also physical genocide. They killed many Uyghurs through these terrorist attacks. They even killed Muslim Uyghur, Muslim Uyghurs, imams who didn't agree with the extreme, extreme religious ideas. And Daniel Dumper actually interviewed that, uh, the, the son of that imam who was murdered by this jihadist. And they were supported and funded by US government. So it's not just a accusation. The US government admitted it. They funded those, uh, those people. National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, said it on its website that they have been supporting the East Turkish temple over, I think around the 14 years. Many politicians, military officials from the US also admitted how they wanted to use Uyghurs to, to separate Xinjiang, to dis destabilize uh, China. So I want to kindly remind people who are believing this Xinjiang narrative pushing by Western government, it's not in any good intention. If they succeed, that's when a cultural and a physical genocide would happen. Thank you, that's my speech.